really excited to be here to talk about these terrific, terrific documentaries. Um, Vinay and Sharon, uh, your documentaries were really powerful and thoughtful. Um, before we start our conversation, I'd like to get some introductions from all of the panelists. So maybe we can do it alphabetical order. So we'll start with Alex, Lama, Sharon, and Vinay. Alex, if you could start, please. So hi, my name is Alex Sanga, and I am calling from Delta, British Columbia, which is the Coast Salish Territories, the unceded traditional and ancestral Coast Salish Territories. Um, um, Emergence of the Shadows is my debut feature documentary. I made a short film before that about a transgender woman of color who was a friend of mine and who was murdered. And it was a story of resilience and survival and her strengths and, and provided a platform for other trans women of color. Emergence is more about the coming out journeys of gay, lesbian, Punjabi Sikh people in Metro Vancouver and the reactions of their parents. I'm so happy to be a part of real world. I'm so happy to uh, have my film, you know, shared with the world and all of Toronto, Ontario and the world. And it was a passion project for two years and it was a labor of love. And it was so challenging actually to finish the film in the middle of a pandemic, but we did it and now we're here. So and thanks for having me. And Lama? Hi, everyone. I am Lama, uh, also known as Queer Palestinian on Instagram. I am a Palestinian Egyptian um, community organizer and activist here in Toronto, uh, also colonially known as Toronto under Treaty 13, Dish by One Spoon Covenant. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, conversations around queerness, Muslim identities, gender, transness um, are at the focus of what I do. Um, I work a lot with newcomer uh, queer and trans folks um, and refugees. So these conversations are incredibly important within our communities and I'm really excited to be here. And Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon Lewis, uh, she, her, and I am the producer director of With Wonder, which is a documentary about queer Christians of color. Can we be both? Can we be queer and can we be Christian? And we're of color, of no choice. Um, and uh, I am honored to be here at Real World with this documentary. I've had a long history with Real World and I'm proud that this is, this is a, uh, this is how I'm returning with this doc. And Vinay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vinay. Uh, I'm the director of Emergence Out of the Shadows. Uh, this is my debut feature documentary film. And I'm really excited to be here at um, Real World. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm excited to be part of this panel today. And I'm Nam Kiwanuka, she, her, and I'm a host producer at TVO. Um, and I can't wait to get into this really important conversation. Um, so Vinay, I actually wanted to start with you. And I wanted to start our conversation kind of by jumping forward to the end of your documentary, Emergence Out of the Shadows. Um, and the reason I want to do that is that we often hear of uh, racialized and religious communities rejecting family members because they are gay. Um, in your film, the majority of the parents accept their children and are in their lives. How important is it to hear those stories of acceptance as opposed to stories of rejection? It's very important to tell the stories of redemption and acceptance because um, when it when it happens, it just uh, rejection happens a lot of times in the, in in our culture uh, when it comes to LGBTQ uh, our queer people. Uh, so it is very important to have that positive spin of that story. And um, what we found out, like, we didn't actually plan to include so much religion and spirituality in our story. It just happened so because um, it is the faith, it is their spirituality that helps them accept their children uh, and bring them all together in the end. So um, I thought it came out naturally. And the parents, there's a moment in the documentary when the parents are talking about their children when they were younger, and mm -hmm. there's this sense of pride and love. Um, and not all of the characters in the documentary have that those experiences. Um, but how important was it for you as a storyteller to have that in the film? 
actually it was very important for me to show their childhood like how they started and how the their parents are so excited to have their child and then their um you know uh so it, it is just that when, when they are growing up they have their dreams and aspirations how their child will grow up and what will they do with their lives and everything um but then they find out their child is uh, queer or gay or lesbian or whatever it's just what well, suddenly the the way they they feel towards their child changes in a way and they question themselves and their religion and then their past lives even you know so it is so it was it was very important for me to show that contrast like when they how they started it's all sweet and nice and then suddenly when they find out it becomes sour so it, it was very important for me and uh, sharon in your film we kind of have an extreme opposite reaction with a father and son um, in your film rev jide i hope i'm pronouncing it correctly um he's a pastor in nigeria and his father is also a minister but um, he's so opposed to his son being gay that he supports the Nigerian government who passed an anti-law, uh, anti-gay law that allows the government to imprison anyone who is gay for 14 years. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> read a quote from the movie. Uh, at one point in the film, uh, Rev Jide says, my father didn't take time to listen. He didn't take time to discuss, but he took time to condemn and to vilify me and to humiliate me. Um, and at this point in the film, the Reverend um, gets very emotional and starts to cry. How difficult was it to film that scene? You know, what was so, his name is Reverend Gide. And what was so hard about doing that scene, it was in London, England, and we went in and I didn't have my crew that I had had, you know, when we were here in Toronto. And so the sound person was a Nigerian guy. And Reverend Gide tensed up as soon as the, the sound guy came in because he didn't know, you know, if this sound guy was going to act funny when he was putting on his lap or act weirdly. And um, it was such a, a, a moment of exactly what his journey has been and what he's had to go through. Um, it was painful. So it, it was actually kind of tense with the sound person, not overly so, but just enough where uh, I could tell that he felt uncomfortable. And then when he started talking about his dad, I think it took him and me, um, we didn't know that that was gonna come up. And he, you know, when he talked about it, it's almost like for the first time, he was really seeing like, my father was in Lagos instituting laws that would have me jailed and and almost um encouraging violence against his own son and his dad is of the church i think that was what was so extraordinarily hard to to hear reverend gide talk about and and the other part of that is he has this beautiful beautiful memory of his dad baptizing him in the water you know, and um, and how spiritual and enclosed they both felt to God. And uh, yeah, it was difficult. And I just want to say there was a line in the movie Emergence Out of the Shadows that really stuck with me with the parents when they said, um, I love you the same as I loved you yesterday yes. and tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So powerful. Like that line was so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that, you know, that's something that uh, we grappled with in our film as well, that when you have these religious parents who are talking about love and and uh, teaching the Bible, uh, you know, in terms of Christianity, and that they could turn that into hate is what really shocked me and what I wanted to explore with them and how much that damaged them. Oh, yes. I, and that's where I, that's where I wanted to go with you next, because, you know, um, the religion, especially in your film, religion, it's not it's a part of life. It's not even just uh, something that you choose. It, it It's ingrained um, in everything, uh, in all the small actions that parents have between their children on a day to day basis. And now these, you know, they're not only are they losing their parents, they're also 
losing that connection, that community. Exactly. Did anything exactly. did anything surprise you um, while you were filming that? That kind of like that. I don't know what you would call it. That kind of it's not tension, but there's so much loss. Yeah, and I think that's it's a real class issue as well, right? Like you're talking about. I'm from Jamaica, and my family's from the city and has certain privileges. You know, you're talking about rural Jamaican lesbian who has connection to the one small church. And that church controls all of the all of the um, all of the donations that come into that village, all of the the uh, social status that goes on in that village. So I really wanted to show that world and how important because coming out as a white straight gay guy is hard, and I'm not saying that's not hard, but it's so different when you're under a colonial religion and you're in a rural village and you're a woman on top of that. Uh, the, you know, there's a whole different stratus that's going on. She's risking her life and she's risking any connection to community or to her family um, by coming out and by standing up to that local priest. And by and, choosing herself. And choosing herself. And, you know, one of the participants, you know, she talks about, do I, do I come out or you know, do I choose the devil or do I, do I choose God? Do I choose God? And then she sort of caught herself and it's like, no, it's not the devil. But I, but I think when she's speaking about that, she's really, really struggling with, she's still in the midst of that struggle. She hasn't found uh, a way yet to sort of have religion and, ha and be queer at the same time. And you she know? says she wants to be a good Christian. Yes. She wants to be a good Christian, but she wants to walk with the woman on her arm as well. Mm. You know, so she's really struggling with that. And I hope the film shows that she's dealing with a whole set of uh, challenges that we in the West or Maurice, who is a lawyer, who's in the documentary, who's educated and comes from a family who um, is able to support him in his middle class. And he's a man does not have to deal with. He actually says at one point that he's in a privileged uh, position, but I'm going to come back to, to Maurice in a few moments. Um, Lama, did you ever feel, uh, did you ever feel that you had to choose between your religion and culture versus your queerness? Um, definitely earlier in my figuring out my queerness, I think I thought that I have to choose that I have to choose whether I'm going to be Muslim, am I going to be Arab, Palestinian, Egyptian, or queer, that all of these things can't come together. And I remember even as a kid, the reason why it took me so long to identify with being queer was that I didn't think it was an option. Um, I didn't grow up in North America, I grew up in Egypt, and I didn't see a lot of queerness around me. It wasn't even a conversation. I was exposed to I, all the feelings, all the interactions, all the queerness at a very young age in terms of who I am, but uh, I didn't see queerness around me and, and relationships around me. Um, but now after finding community, finding the queer Muslim community, queer Palestinian community and queer Arab communities, um, there is nothing to reconcile. And I talk about that all the time. Um, unfortunately, because of colonization, our cultures have adopted a very, um, very colonial concept of love and marriage and sexuality and a very strict binary that actually does not exist in the religion itself. Um, and through going back to religion and, and reading the Quran in my own eyes, having these conversations with spiritual leaders in the community, um, I realized that there is nothing to reconcile. Queerness is not criminalized or demonized in the religion. If anything, love is so spoken about in such beautiful ways that once I started growing into my queerness and growing into my community, I felt closer to my religion. I felt like I wanted to know more about my religion and be closer to um, my, my Muslim identity. I think the hard thing is when it comes to any kind of reconciliation between my queerness and my religion is how the community exists. So unfortunately, a lot of, of very religious communities and exists, I think from the conversation, we can see this exists in a lot of different um, religions is there's this demonization and criminalization of queerness. And so it feels like I have to kind of dim that in Muslim spaces. Um, and that must hurt though, doesn't it? 
Sorry. That must hurt though, doesn't it? It really does. It really does because I come from a collective culture. We work with community all the time. You're part of community. You can't just cut yourself off from community and to have to dim yourself to feel accepted or to feel like you're almost holding on to a lie is really difficult. Um, but since being in queer Muslim spaces and feeling like I can bring my whole self in, because alternatively in queer spaces, I felt like I have to tone down my Muslim identity because I've had people say, are That's you, interesting. do you hate yourself? Like, is that why you still call yourself Muslim? Like it's a religion that hates you. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. Community does, unfortunately, mostly because of how colonization changed, how we interpret it, religion and how the patriarchy changed that. I go back to the literature, go back to the books, go back to all of that, and it doesn't say that. Um, so, yeah, finding that middle ground, I think finding community has really helped me grow into myself and realize I have nothing to reconcile. I just need to settle into my skin and get comfortable. Um, and uh, Alex, I just wanted to build on what Lama just said. In With Wonder, Maurice in the documentary says that, um, I still have faith, but not faith in the church. Does that resonate with you? And also your mother in the documentary is the best. She's you the know, best. <laughs> I think it was um, Jimmy Carter who said, President Jimmy Carter who said uh, in the Bible, mm. Jesus never said anything bad about gay people. And when I was listening to Lamar talk, I was thinking <laughs> people have their own interpretations and their beliefs on what everything says. And a lot of the people haven't even read the scriptures and the the, the documents and, and done their done their homework. And at the end of the day, what we talk about in emergence is love is love. And I really don't feel God created gay people or queer people or gays and lesbians or transgender people because he wants them to suffer. I believe we are all God's children. I believe God loves us all. We are all human beings. We are part of the human family. And I feel the message that really sort of is centered in the film Emergence Out of the Shadows is one of love and one of family and one of, you know, coming out of the shadows and being embraced. and. Um, I hope that message gets across to our community, especially the South Asian community, the WC community. But you know, there's universal messages of love and acceptance and family and faith in emergence. And I just want people to know that yes, you can be queer. You can also be Sikh. You can also be Christian or Muslim or Hindu. I mean, our film focuses on basically a case study of Punjabi Sikh queer people in Metro Vancouver and the reactions of their parents. However, our director, Vinay himself, is actually Hindu from Kerala in South India. So he was looking at our story from a very objective lens and doing a lot of research and trying to, he was learning as he was going. <laughs> so, but for me, the, you know, the message is one of love. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, all these faiths have one message, and that is to love each other. Um, you know, I think in a, a perfect world, we would all want to, we we want that to be the thing that defines us. And um, But there is a lot of pain in the documentary uh, in Emergence. There's a lot of, uh, you also went through a period where you didn't, you know, you had that uh, internal battle with yourself. Um, and I think it was Caden in the documentary that said that uh, when you come out, you come out twice, you come out once to yourself um, and then to others. Can you relate to that? Yeah, I really feel a lot of what makes, there's intersectional oppression that we deal with as people of color and as queer people of color. It's hard enough to come out as a queer person to the broader mainstream society but then you also have to come out to your own community. You also have to come out within the Punjabi community, the Sikh community, whichever community you belong to. And not everyone in that community is accepting. You know, and the sad thing is, look what happened to Caden in our film. And he had to find his chosen family. You know, Caden had to find his chosen family. And 
you know, the sad thing is in my life, in my life, Nam, the numbers of people in my biological family who are supposed to be there for me and support me now that I'm 49 years old, I just had a Thanksgiving. I had my mom and my brother who were part of my biological family there and I had 12 people who were my friends. My biological family has rejected me on both sides of my family. As a 49 year old gay man, they don't want me going visiting them. They don't want me around their kids. They don't want me um, associating with them. They feel, you know, if I go to their house, I feel as an outsider. If I go to their home, I feel like an outsider. I don't feel like I'm welcomed. And I have those that- And it must be painful, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like, what did I do wrong? And why am I being treated this way? And sometimes silence speaks volumes. Sometimes silence feels speaks volumes when people don't say anything, but they, they have that sort of judgmental kind of look. And so, you know, I, I remember I took Caden to visit my cousins one time and he, he said they never, no one said anything in the room to him, but he said it was so cold and he didn't feel welcomed and he really just wanted to get out of there. He felt so sad, just so sad. And, you know, these are the things that queer people have to deal with and queer people of color have to deal with, you know, and so... Sometimes people have to come out with multiple, multiple oppression. It's not just double discrimination in terms of being a queer person and a person of color. Sometimes people are dealing with poverty and disability and low income, and they're dealing with, um, you know, they're an immigrant to this country, like Caden was an immigrant. He had to deal with his whole immigration status, which was in limbo as well. So not only is he struggling to, to find a family, he, he's at risk of being deported. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy now. It's not easy. And I'm, you know, I, I, I just hope and I pray that, you know, and I'm really looking forward to watch Sharon's film after listening to, listening to this, <laughs> listening to what she was talking about. Right. And I really want to see that scene in the church with the, with, you know, with that, with the, with the, you know, talking about, you know, in, in Nigeria, but, you know, I'm just, to me, there's the, so many, there's so many layers to this, right? As you said, so many you know, one thing I want to say is the film at, at times was psychologically being a cast member was because Vinay never told me the questions ahead of time. He captured my responses raw and fresh on camera, as I said them. And some of it was emotionally triggering and traumatizing for me because I haven't thought about these feelings for many, many, many years, and they all came to the surface. Is it difficult to watch the documentary? It is kind of difficult, but you know, in a way it was also therapeutic and brought closure. So I had all three of those feelings. I had one of trauma, one of thera therapeutic, and one of closure. And you know, I even, as the producer of the film, arranged for uh, debriefing and counseling and everything after I went through that experience, I figured, what about everyone else? So I had to make sure we provided for that. And um, so, yeah, it's, you know, there's intersectional layers of oppression that people of color have to deal with, especially queer people of color. Vinay, I wanted to ask you that same question. You know, as Caden said in the uh, documentary, that you come out multiple times, you come out to yourself and then you come out to others. Um, can you relate to that? Yeah, um, hearing these stories, you always think about um, what they are going through, and then it, it is you can you you have to you have to be there to listen to what they are saying, and then just create the story around it. So when they are coming out, they are coming out to themselves. Jag mentioned that as well in that movie. Um, they are coming out to themselves, and they and they have to make sure they understand that they are queer, and this is what they are. This they need to self-identify. And then they have to talk to their parents or family or their friends and find support that way. So it is always a, a dual role. And some people have uh, heard that they have to go back into into the closet, like later on in their life, even after living a full um, uh, full life as a gay person, they have to go back to the closet when they are towards the end of their lives. Uh, I've been told it's just. It's really sad. It just um, because people always there is always bias against how you are living your life, 
and then uh, people treat you differently. So just like uh, what um, Alex mentioned with Karen going into um, Alex's um, friends or relative's house, it's just they, they don't treat you the same way. So sometimes you have to hide who you are and then, um, you know, be and feel safe when you can. And Lama, have you gone through that too? Because I, I can I can imagine too, there might be a feeling of that you're betraying yourself. Have you had that experience where you feel like you have to come out multiple times? Oh, absolutely. I always say that. I So generally, I don't believe there is a coming out, at least for our communities and the way it stands. Um, I think it's always going, we live in a very heteronormative, homophobic world. Um, and I always say coming out into what, and it's usually coming out into that. Um, it's it's really difficult to find community and to find spaces. And when you do find that, that becomes kind of your safe space to actually truly exist as everything that you are. But outside of that, it's a constant series of coming out. So even when talking to my parents and coming out to them, it's a conversation that is ongoing to this day. Like it's never done to explain things and to answer the questions and in community as well. Like you, people don't look at me and assume, even though I look, queer, whatever that means, people don't, like, they automatically assume I'm a cishet person. They don't know what non-binary is, they don't know what queer is, or even if they know, they wouldn't associate associate that with me because I'm Muslim, I'm Arab, I'm Palestinian, I'm Egyptian. Our community doesn't do that. And that's also true for communities that are outside of that community, because the second I say I'm Arab, I'm Muslim, people assume that I am not queer. Like I, I remember first year of university, I went to um, the club fair and I went to kind of a queer club to get I like to get an idea of what they're doing and what programming is available to me. And they automatically assumed I'm an ally, which was really funny. And I was like, what? I have so many problems with that word ally, but that's another conversation for another yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm, I'm a member. <laughs> <laughs> so it feels like my entire life is a series of explaining myself and coming out and all of these things and so it, even in my programming and in my community we use the term coming in or bringing in so coming into our queerness and bringing people into our queerness and creating safe community spaces for us to exist um, and in those spaces I feel I can show up truly as everything that I am I as brown as Arab as Muslim as queer as all of them. I love that because sometimes when you hear coming out, it's as if you're hiding like a, a bad secret or something. Because uh, um, language is so important, right? Absolutely. Um, Vinay and Sharon, uh, shame and fear are common in uh, both of your films. Um, and there seems to be so much pressure for children, well, who are now adults, but there seems to be so much pressure for them to live up to the expectations of their parents. Um, and there is a worry that once they come out, they will lose their parents, they will lose their communities, they will lose home. Um, and in Sharon's film, your film, uh, Phil says that uh, her mother tolerates her like Jamaicans tolerate mosquitoes um, and that uh, she can't be mad at her mother because um, it's the religious institutions and the governments who are responsible uh, for planting these seeds of fear. This question is for all of you, but I wanted to start with you, Sharon. What role do you think those institutions play in creating the atmosphere of shame and fear that tears up families? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, when you listen to Phil talking about that, about the shame with her family, which comes from Christian colonial attitudes, but also she brought up, you know, the idea that, um, that colonial law is still on the books in Jamaica from, from the 1860s. Yes. So imagine Britain is still ruling Jamaica with this anti-sodomy law from the 1860s. That's a law that they decided to keep on the books that is that is from slave days. You know what I mean? So I think when you look at that, where you look at the core of shame and where that shame is coming from, particularly in colonial um, colonial or ex-colonial communities, there's a very particular type of shame that comes from that. I'm not saying that uh, homophobia doesn't deal, you know, isn't in, in cultures outside of colonialists, but it plays a very particular role in how families 
are going to accept you. Again, if you're if you're coming from a colonial country and and where you belong is up here, so the lighter you are, the straighter you are, the richer you are, the more you belong. So you keep going down that. So now I'm queer, I'm dark, and I'm rural. Do you know what I mean? You you keep it that comes from a colonial set of standards of where status comes from. That does not come from a religious set of standards, Sikh set of standards, Hindu or Christian. That comes from a colonial set of standards. So we are dealing with shame and fear in multiple layers. And I just want to say this too. Lama had brought this up. You know, there's this idea of of reconciling our spirituality with our community and our queerness. But there's also this whole weird other side that if you're spiritual in the sort of white queer community, you're not cool. Like you gotta be secular to be cool and to fit into that scene. So there's also coming out as spiritual in that space. It's it's a very, you know, you get those questions like Lama was saying like, well, aren't you sort of, you know, you're just kind of, um, self-hating if you're Christian or you're self-hating if you're believing in this colonialist religion or you're self-hating if you so it's a weird thing to deal with in the secular queer community that is also sort of ruled by different you know different rules and it's usually straight white men or gay gay white men who are well straight white men who make the rules and then gay white men who are making different rules um who who rule that sort of area. So it's it's really interesting this coming out and this constant coming out kind of thing and where shame and fear come from. Um, because there's a, um, oh my gosh, Serena says it. She's like, shame doesn't come from God. Shame came from other people. She says that. And, uh, and I think when she knows that and she reconciled that, she was able to marry her wife and they have a kid. And it was really important for me to, for you to see images of love and queer love and family um, where they have let go of that shame because we need hope, right? And these mm -hmm. documentaries, Emergence and With Wonder, I feel offer hope because at the end of the day, if it's only about uh, the struggle that we're going through and not the survival, you know, then we're not doing our due diligence to say, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You're not alone. There is that saying that uh, joy is resistance. Um, and uh, something that you mentioned about, um, you know, you you have to be either one thing or another thing. Um, and the realization that, you know, I think with a lot of these uh, religions, um, in order to have a happy life, you're supposed to do things a certain way. Um, you get married to the opposite sex, you have children. And if you're gay, you there's this idea that you can't have those. And I think it was Serena that was like, all these things that I wanted and I didn't think I could ever have, I now have. Actually, I think that was Jag in uh, Emergence. Um, is Was that important also to reflect that um, happiness can look different, but the same? Yes, of course. Um, we we're talking about hope. You, you need hope to live the life uh, that you want to live in this world because um, when you talk about queer people in South Asian or any culture, they really don't have any, they don't have, um, they, they cannot relate to anybody else. The media doesn't represent them properly. They don't know where to look up to. They don't have proper role models. It's really important for them to have hope that they can, you know, like do something great with their lives. And um, it was very important with the emergence that we provide because the name of the movie, Out of the Shadows, we want to bring them out of the shadows and bring them to light and give them hope and uh, and yeah uh, that that is the message that the uh, emergence wants to convey and uh, hopefully people get that well i want to um, alex i want to build on something that vinay just said you know your producer in the film um vinay and sharon are storytellers and we, we talk about representation and representation matters how do documentaries like this like emergence help to shape the discourse around queerness religion and culture you know it's so important to have representation and um you know if you look at emergence almost everyone in there is either queer gay or lesbian or a person of color and same with behind the camera our cinematographer is transgender and uh you know, I'm the producer, I'm a gay, Punjabi Sikh, South Asian male. Um, you know, Vinay is South Asian from South India, an immigrant. Um, 
we believe in creating opportunities for people of color and queer people and because we feel not only is it good storytelling for people to have the lived experience so in order to have stories that are true and authentic and real you know if you're going to share a story about a group that is queer and bipoc then nothing about us without us that's what they say now for Indigenous communities. And I agree for BIPOC and for queer people, nothing about us without us. And so if we didn't have um, queer people in certain, in my first film or section film for certain scenes or whatever, we would run it by queer people and we would get feedback at different stages of the cut. And we would try to reach out to as many people as possible. And, you know, the unique thing about Emergence is it's not just a queer film, actually. It's also, it, we also created the film to help heterosexual parents who had queer children because they also need education and they also need understanding and they also need support in coming to terms with their children's sexuality. At the end of the day, it's the parents and the extended families and the broader society that have the power, really, mm -hmm. that have the power to love, to accept, or reject their, the child. We don't want what happened to Caden to happen to any other kid. So this film, you know, is a queer film, yes, but it's also, you know, many ways a, a straight film, and it's, it's also targeting that audience as well. And um, it's a, it's a, it has universal themes, and and you know, we're hoping we're hoping to get it into schools and colleges and universities and get it out there and educate our communities and someone i watched an orthodox Sikh person watch this film emerges and i thought oh no he's gonna bash the film he goes you know what alex i have to say one thing i really liked about emergence is you did not bash our culture you did not bash our community you did not blame our community you did not say punjabi Sikh people are horrible people you shared the truth, you shared the real stories, you let people walk away with and coming to their own conclusions about the film. You had no agenda. You had really no agenda, but people walk away feeling moved. They feel it's an emotionally gripping, heart-wrenching story, and they cannot help but empathize and show empathy towards the people in the film. And this was his comments, and I said, Okay, that's Vinay doing that. <laughs> no, um, honestly, yeah, honestly. Vinay. Well, Vinay, how did you do? How did you do that? Um, uh, I I didn't have a strategy or anything. Just I I I wanted to show that the actually the childhood part was uh, you cannot hate on a baby. Mm -hmm. So and then the childhood pictures and like so I think that was strategically put there just to show that they are normal people. They they are just a normal boy or a girl. They're growing up, they're doing their thing. And they show those traits, even if they are like six, seven months old, or maybe even like the, you know, they, they like to dress a certain way. They prefer this kind of thing. They prefer dolls over cars. Like, so you want to show that they, it is how they are. And th they didn't create that themselves. They didn't, they are not acting in a certain way to get attention or anything. This is how they are, it's natural for them. And uh, we, what we wanted to do was to create a normalcy uh, when we see queer people uh, in media and uh, representing them in a way that they, it, to show that it's normal, like there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing strange or weird or anything. It's just, they're just normal people. They're living their lives and uh, giving, giving them hope that you know they can su succeed in life. Um, uh, Lama, I wanted to ask you that question that I asked Sharon, because um, what we just heard from Vinay and Alex, um, within the cultures themselves, parents are, they're not, you know, I don't know if they're conspiring to not love their children, but if you go to uh, a place of worship and the person, even if it's not in the holy book, uh, by the person, or if there's this idea within the society that this is wrong, um, th that you need to repent, that this is, you're choosing a lifestyle. Um, and parents uh, work with that information. What role do you think that those institutions, those religious institutions play in creating that shame um, and fear that we were talking about earlier? 
I loved what Sharon said when she mentioned how it's out of colonization because like Jamaica, Egypt is following Napoleon's rules, French rules. <laughs> um, and it's it's really funny because they are just upholding systems of power. They're still upholding the patriarchy that has been enforced by colonization. Classism and colonization all go together because it all has to do with what will people say? What will who and who say? And it's all a cycle of upholding colonial structures and rules to make sure that our queerness is suppressed, that we are not truly liberated and we are controlled and it all ties to each other. Um, so I think it's sort of foolish that these institutions are just, you know, they're supposed to be working towards liberating the people, working towards decolonizing the peoples, even though we're technically post-colonial, we're really not. Um, so they, they work really hard to do that. And unfortunately, because of the cycles of colonization that Egypt has gone through and the region in general, like Southwest Asia and North Africa has gone through, it's so entrenched into the culture. It's taking so much on learning. Um, and in conversations with my family, there's, there's a lot of talk about why, why would people, why do we care about what people say? Why don't we want to liberate ourselves from that? And Whenever I got to a point with my mom, especially about talking about how these, where these structures are rooted, like I keep asking why, where did it come from? And we keep tracing it back till we get to the point, okay, this is ideology isn't even ours, didn't come from us. She gets really frazzled. And I think it's because these are the structures she's grown to know. So to get to a point where you're like, wait, all of this is a facade and gender doesn't exist as we know it and sexuality, they get scared. So they just hold on to what they know. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it, it's taking a lot of conversations to unlearn that shame, even within myself and internalized homophobia and transphobia. But these conversations are so important. And I think we, while if we continue to do that, we will get somewhere, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but I've definitely seen a lot of progress within my community and family by just having these conversations together about like, where did this come from and realizing it didn't come from us. Um, and, you know, we know that it's going to take time for a lot of, well, maybe that's not fair to say, um, institutions and uh, our societies have pretty much been a certain way, as you mentioned, uh, as both you and Sharon mentioned. Um, and, you know, if we live in Canada, it's a very different reality. I am from Uganda. And I remember a few years ago, about 10 years ago, when I went back and there was um, a debate, well, I think it wasn't a debate, but uh, people had been outed in uh, a paper mm -hmm. and uh, mobs, people went to their homes, they lost their jobs, their lives were destroyed. And Sharon, um, I wanted to talk to you, you know, uh, the Reverend in Nigeria is putting his life uh, at risk, just being out and um, also running his church, the House of Rainbow. And Maurice in Jamaica, uh, we talked about his privilege. And in the film, he says, you know, I'm privileged because I can leave Jamaica. But there's a lot of people in my community here who can't. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who were part of the first Pride Walk there. Um, and he said that it was his responsibility to speak out for those who marginalized, who were marginalized. And he also said that, you know, that's actually more Christ-like than anything, because um, Christ uh, was a champion for people on the margins. Um, you know, in Jamaica, people are murdered for being queer. Uh, how dangerous is it to be queer in Nigeria and Jamaica? Well, people are murdered here in Canada to be queer as well. So I think that that needs to be stated that Canada is not a safe place either. And that the number of trans deaths in Canada are outrageous um, and not to mention indigenous and then add queer on top of that. So murder takes place in Canada as well and goes um, uh, justice isn't equal here. In Jamaica, uh, and it's really important for me to state that because I don't want to otherize Jamaica or Nigeria in a way that separates it from Canada. There are different laws and colonial laws that are going on in Jamaica and Nigeria that again are tied to class and colonialism and where they are in the strata in terms of um, the ability to have access to funding and, and resources and all of that, that impact the level of homophobia in those countries. So I think it's important to say that. 
um, not to excuse it, but to make sure that we see it in that context. And I and and I do want to say that is what compelled me to do this documentary. When I met Maurice, I was doing a, the other documentary about the first openly gay black uh, conductor in Canada. And I met Maurice and he said he was going to go on a walk in Montego Bay, a pride walk in Montego Bay. And I had never come out to my family in Jamaica. And I thought, you know, if this man can do it and go there and walk in Montego Bay, I'm going to join that pride walk and I'm going to film it. And I'm going to, you know, put my face on this documentary. But I, like Maurice, can leave. You know, I've got privilege. Um, and the other people there had to stay. So it was really important to me with Reverend Gide and with uh, the people in Jamaica and even Lady Phil, that they were all clear about the dangers that they were presenting for themselves and for other people by, by coming out and showing their faces. And there was probably about five other women who who uh, I didn't feature in the documentary, who shared their stories with me, but for fear of their life, couldn't actually um, put their faces in the documentary. I just want to say this because I don't want it to end on, on this note. It was so important for me and with wonder for you to also see the joy, the love, the complexity of people that we didn't get reduced down to our queerness and homophobia. And that's why it was so important to have D'Lo, who is a trans Tamil comic, and he's doing stand-up comedy throughout. So funny. Yeah, and he's funny, and he brings hope, and he brings another way of dealing with the trauma. And it was it, it's vital for those who um, are listening to know that both of these documentaries provide love and humor and um, a complexity of relationship and looking for jobs and you know humanness that's so important that we don't keep getting reduced down to being one thing um i wanted to even in the documentary i just noticed the time apologies <laughs> um maurice mentioned that you know his dad had a really difficult time accepting uh, him being gay, but he was at the parade and uh, he said that he actually drove uh, the rainbow bus. Um, how important are um, those spaces uh, like House of Rainbow and even what uh, Alex is doing with Cher? I just will jump in quickly. They save lives. Alex is literally saving lives. Reverend Gide is saving lives. Maurice Tomlinson is saving lives. And Alex, I do want to um, come in on that because in in the documentary, we saw that, you know, at one point in your life, you were considering um, uh, suicide. And then in the end, you end up saving uh, Caden. Um, what does it mean to you when you think about that? You know, I was just doing what I had to do as a social worker to save a kid in a crisis situation. It didn't really hit me until I watched the film. And then they presented it to, to me in a documentary that I thought. And then when Caden was talking to me on the bench overlooking the smoky, the smoky day and the foggy day in the river, and Caden was telling me how he felt about being part of my his new family, I thought that's when it really hit me that all it takes is one person mm. to help another person, and then we can change the whole world. And I wanted to give Vinay and Lama 30 seconds each before we uh, wrap. Uh, Vinay, you can go first. Uh, I can listen to Sharon for hours. I, I love the way you speak. And I'm really excited to watch your film uh, sometime soon. And then, uh, and then uh, for this movie, I, I, all we had to say is love is love, and it's another, just another way of loving. And then um, it's normal, you're who you are, and uh, be proud of it. And Lama, any final thoughts? Um, like Sharon said, and Alex said, like queer BIPOC spaces are saving lives, definitely saved mine. Um, definitely very heartwarming to get to be in these spaces and get to know that they're there and there i'm very thankful for plenty of them in the city and yeah just knowing that there is nothing to reconcile when it comes to our spirituality and ourselves we are who we are we exist at all times as the identities that we are a part of um, and it's a matter of just finding the right communities and spaces to get to settle into our skin into ourselves um, and our families comfortably so 
yeah, wherever that is for you, try to find it because it, it is so, so important to get to be your whole self in a space, even if that space is just with you. Thank you all so much for being so generous with your time and your thoughtfulness. I really do appreciate it. I know um, I was asking a lot uh, this evening. Uh, both films will be uh, showing at uh, the 21st Real World Film Festival, which kicks off uh, from October 20th to October 27th. Thank you so much.